honor to introduce our panel today. Can you hear me? Um, I'm going to go. No. Okay. I'm going to talk closer into the microphone. All right. Um, going in order, Uriel Casada is the former director of the Loyola Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and now he is gracious enough to serve as associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. He's written about everything from Central American detective fiction to Latin American masculinities to travel writing, but particularly the study of gender and sexuality. He's published eight books of fiction and also serves as editor of Queer Brown Voices, 14 Personal Narratives of Latina Latino Activism. He's from San Jose and has degrees from the U Universidad de Costa Rica, New Mexico State University, and a PhD from Tulane. Um, we have next Elizabeth Schwartz is a civil rights lawyer in Miami where she grew up. She went away to college at Penn and returned to Miami for law school and a career in helping America live up to its ideals. She represented same-sex couples seeking the right to marry and succeeded in establishing that right in Florida. She has also worked to establish all the other rights important to the ability to create and protect a family. This Having so parents, oh, <laughs> she wrote our bios for us. Exactly. <laughs> Having parents listed on birth certificates, uh, adoption, estate planning, and even divorce. She writes and lectures on gay rights nationally, and recently published "Before I Do: A Legal Guide to Marriage, Gay and Otherwise." All of the things that people should talk about and often do not before they get legally married. Um, third, to my right is Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. She's a native of New Orleans and is living in the Bay Area at least until we get her to move home, <laughs> which we are working on now because remember the weather is like this every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she <laughs> studied creative writing at Dartmouth and law at Berkeley and is a reform lawyer. And I can tell you as a lawyer, every lawyer dreams that really they're gonna write the great American novel instead of practicing law and she's actually doing it. Um, she won a Lombard fellowship and studied civil rights in the Dominican Republic. And her first novel, A Kind of Freedom, was a finalist for the National Book Award. And the New York Times called it a luminous and remarkably <laughs> assured first novel and her a writer of uncommon nerve and talent. Um, <laughs> and I was going to start by asking her where she went to high school, but she actually did move away a little bit before high school. Um, and then Calvin Trillin, who needs no introduction, but born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri, until he went off to college at Yale and became chair of the Yale Daily News. He did a stint in the Army and became a reporter at the Atlanta Bureau of Time magazine from the fall of 1960 to the fall of 61, which meant he covered everything from the New Orleans desegregation crisis to the Freedom Rides. And he has became a staff writer for The New Yorker in 1963 and remains one, having written more than 300 articles. He's focused on humor, food, family, travel, loving commentary about America. He's also published 18 books, novels, memoirs, short stories, and his best-selling messages from my father. He just published a book called Jackson 1964 with 50 years of his reporting on race in America. So let's welcome all of our panelists. So I'll start with Uriel. You write about those who find themselves marginalized um, and marginalized within marginalized communities of the intersections of race and gender and sexuality. What are the differences for you in writing about those voices in fiction versus capturing oral histories? And how do you capture those oral histories? Well, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. And thank you for the difficult questions. Uh, well, th this book, um, for all histories is about Latino, Latina, LGBT activism. So we're talking about a minority within a minority, or sometimes a minority within a minority within a minority. Because when we, even when we talk about activism, mm, we're not exempt of um, making the same mistakes. So many of these activists that started working uh, in the uh, late 70s and the 80s, uh, didn't, didn't have a place to go. Not within the Latino community, not uh, within the LGBT community. In many cases, they were not even allowed to uh, go to a bar or enter a bar. Um, multiple discriminations. Um, when I started the project along with uh, a couple of friends from Washington DC, part of the reason 
to do this project was that there, those activists were not included in the, let's say, the official history of LGBTQ activism in the United States. There were, there was another type of marginalization. So we decided to uh, tell the story of, of this important group of activists, uh, but taking advantage and most, most of them are still alive. So first of all, we decided to work with a very specific group, uh, people that um, started their activist uh, career in the late 70s, early 80s, and finished around 2000. Even though many of them are still you know, involved with our, with our organization, but not at the same level of leadership. And there's a, a big difference between fiction, of course, when you take a material called to give a different example, New Orleans, I would think, okay, I'm kind of a, a weird bird here because I write a lot about New Orleans in Spanish uh, for a different audience. And you create your own world based on many cases in, on your own rules. When you're collecting the stories, you're basically facilitating their voice to be heard. You you have to listen, you have to become a very good listener, and you have to help them remember, which is sometimes a very uh, painful process. So we work on 14 stories. Um, about eight of those stories are traditional oral histories. No, you, you have a coffee, uh, with this person, you talk to this person, you then take that material and work in a way that is not your voice, but the other person's voice, the one that is in the test, in his or her narrative. Then we have uh, about three in which our role, especially my role, was the role of the listener. I was the person that helped those activists remember. And then, based on that material, that you know, sometimes the document, when you finally transcribe the document, was like 50 pages, single space narrative. Very chaotic. Because only in the movies we remember, you know, <laughs> in a sequence, no? We, we don't remember things like that. And finally, uh, perhaps of the three, they wrote their own narrative. We invited about uh, 35 people to participate in this project for different reasons. Only 14 made it to the book. Uh, but I think that the book represents a very interesting and for many people never seen picture of activism in the United States, LGBT activism in the United States, Latino history in the United States, and of course, LGBT Latino Latina history. So, um, Elizabeth, you've been by writing about human rights <laughs> in a different format, sometimes Huffington Post and speeches you give, but also in writing briefs to persuade judges of um, uh, inviting empathy, of telling stories, of trying to persuade them of co your common humanity with them. Um, in doing that work, we've had all of these amazing changes and successes, how fragile do you think those successes remain? And what inspired you to write your book about marriage? Thank you, Professor Tetlow, and thank you for those, those amazing bios that you did of us. It's so refreshing to <laughs> sort of hear someone else's kind of perspective, so mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, and, and thank you to Tennessee Williams uh, for inviting me. Um, and Saints and Sinners, woo -hoo. Uh, So. Well, okay, so uh, there are two things that you asked there. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the book in a second, but, but uh, I'll keep track of time so I don't go on too long. Um, the, the, uh, we made so many amazing gains, right, in the Obama mm -hmm. administration, the LGBT community, um, and, and sort of over time that, that it, it feels like we should just be, we should keep propelling forward, right? But obviously, I mean, whatever your politics are, it's just, it's, it's incredibly clear 
that the administration of the current occupant of the White House um, is gunning for the LGBT community in, in many ways uh, and on a many fronts. So, I mean, that's just undeniable. Uh, so, so our, our kind of orientation now is, is we're not really thinking about making gains as much as we're just trying to hold a line. You know, we're just trying to, to kind of keep, to, to, to hold back against the onslaught um, of all of these efforts coming from every direction uh, uh, at our community. And, and so, so sort of the, the first thing I tend to say it, it, since the Trumpocalypse began uh, to LGBT people is, is, you know, your marriages are safe, okay? Because that's everybody's concern. Like, what about my marriage? Okay, your marriage is fine. You don't have to run out and get married. Your marriage is mm -hmm. fine. Um, and I could bore you with principles of stare decisis and how it's really quite unlikely that the Supreme Court, regardless of how conservative it might get, and send your B12 shots to Justice Ginsburg and pray that Justice Kennedy doesn't retire. Um, but uh, but there, there are, the, the Supreme Court tends to respect its decisions, right? So um, there are two fantastically well-reasoned decisions that brought us marriage equality, uh, the Windsor case in 2013, Obergefell in 2015. So, so your marriages are safe. And I always kind of like to start with that, to dispose of that, because that's really, I mean, marriage was never gonna bring liberation to the LGBT community, and it certainly hasn't, and it's certainly not the answer for, for, for everyone. It certainly doesn't bring justice to poor people, to rural people, to single people, you know, to, to trans people. I mean, it's just, so So I always like to sort of get the marriage conversation out of the way, even though, oddly enough, I wrote a whole damn book about it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, uh, but certainly, as I say, sort of in the Trumpocalypse, I think it's important to think about uh, what we, what we do need to worry about as a community, um, uh, and and there and and right, so so we may still have the right to marry, but like you probably want to pre-order that wedding cake if you're thinking of getting married, because this masterpiece cake case um, is is could be. I mean, I'd be interested to know wh what your read is on it, what you think is going to happen, but but this whole like couching, you know, uh, uh, discrimination as f religious freedom is just. I mean. I, I'm a person of faith. I'm sure many in this room are as well. I mean, it's really offensive uh, to 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 sort of say that your faith would would give you license to discriminate against people. I mean, it's just it's nuts. So um, so um, in fact, right now, because you're probably thinking, thanks for whining at us. What can we do? Um, so HHS, have you has anybody heard about this new rule that HHS has has um, uh, put forth and the comment period on it ends March 27th, which is mm. Tuesday. So this is the rule called um, Protecting Statutory Conscience Rights in Healthcare. Statutory, what's statutory? Okay, well, protecting conscience rights in healthcare, that's that's the government asking for license to discriminate against you and giving you healthcare. So, oh, you need some like meds for, you know, to confirm your trans identity, sorry, we, I don't want to serve you. Oh, same-sex female couple, whatever. Oh, sorry, I don't. I, for religious reasons, I do not want to serve you, and the government has now protected me from doing so. So, um, so this is a. Uh, th these public comments are really important. So, if you want to take the time to do it, if you want to run, run up to me afterwards, I'm happy to give you the info. It's like super easy to just do some clicks, and um, and you can weigh you can uh, weigh in on this. Uh, the, the, this rule that purports to protect individuals and entities with objections to certain activities based on religious belief and moral convictions. Thank you, Alana, for taking very good notes. I love that about you. Um, <laughs> so, so, and of course, of course, the rule is, is more pandering than problem solving because this is that's why it's a statutory because statutory there's already protections you know for religious freedom expression. So this is really going above and beyond. Um, Anyway, so um, so really quickly, just a couple of other things to sort of think about in, in, in the Trumpocalypse. Um, first of all, binational couples, um, you know, we thought that your marriage was going to protect you, but again, this government is gunning after, after you know, people who are, are undocumented, people who are not citizens. Um, in fact, I'll say the same thing that I've said to a trans person at breakfast today. Um, you have got to make sure that your ducks are in a row. There are folks who are just emboldened beyond belief in, everywhere from, I mean, I just heard an awful story this past week from the Social Security Administration. A lesbian couple, the non -bio, they had a kid, the non-biological mother passed away and the Supreme, in the uh, Social Security Administration said to her, 
like we said to her survivor, oh, well, show me the adoption judgment. Well, they were both on the birth certificate. They were both on the birth certificate. So the Social Security Administration, these these folks who now have the their sincerely held religious beliefs, and they're gonna that's their uh, license to discriminate against you. Um, they they are not regarding that birth certificate of the child that they had in the context of their marriage as sufficient to give benefits to the right. I mean, it's just nuts. So so. I mean, and we could, in fact, I'm doing another panel all about the book and all about these issues at 11.30, so come talk to me about that. Um, but, but we are just, right now, you've got to, everything that you, if there is an immigration issue, trans issue, and you're married, still have your, your, your advanced directives in place, your will. It's like a belt and suspenders moment, folks. It really is to make sure that anything that's sort of out there about your, you know, anything about your identity that might be somewhat different from kind of like what's going on in the White House, um, it's, it's important to protect yourself. So if you are a trans person, please have all of your identity documents match the way you present because you do not want to come up in front of someone who has some sincerely held religious belief, you know, against you. Um, and so just sort of really quickly, um, the other thing that I will just say um, ab about the book is that um, it really is, you, you know, you asked what inspired me to write it. Um, I was asked to write it by, by my wonderful editor, uh, Julie Enzer um, of Sinister Wisdom fame. Um, Julie is also a professor, and she was finding all these, like, queer kids coming down to her podium after class on Friday, and they were like, oh, we're going to go get married. Like, we're just going to go get married, like super cashy cash. So, um, so she was like, we need a legal guide. You know, we need somebody to like, explain to people like what marriage means and doesn't mean. And she kind of found me because my drumbeat in all the talks I've been giving over all these years is like, yes, lots of pent up demand. We should have the right, no question. But just because you have the right to doesn't mean you should. It doesn't mean you need to, you know? I mean, you could still be committed, certainly, you know, same-sex couples have been for many, many eons committing in relationships without the benefit of the institution of marriage. And of course, why we should absolutely have the right to do it. Um, there, there are lots of considerations for individual people that might make it not for you. So, um, so that sort of, in a nutshell, uh, how, how the book was born. And, um, and I'm really glad that it's sort of a, it, it's written for people. I mean, it's written for the lay person. I mean, it is a lawyer's sort of Lawyer's voice, uh, as I say, the cheapest lawyer's time you'll ever buy. But, but, uh, <laughs> but it is it is written for people at every socioeconomic level. It is national, um, and so I encourage people to to, to pick it up um, and to uh, certainly ask me any questions you know later about your personal situation or come to the next thing. So, Margaret, your novel tells the story of a New Orleans family across three generations, mm. working back and forth between their stories in 1944, 1982, 2010. And you describe fierce familial love in the shadow of segregation and racism. How did you balance the choices between hope and hopelessness of constrained choices and endurance? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. And it's it's one that I've been hearing um, a lot since the book came out. And it's, it's always hard to answer because it was so unconscious. And I think, um, I think that speaks to the degree to which when I was, when I was developing these characters, I, I, I based them on people I knew. So I, I knew these people's stories. I knew their struggles. Um, but I also knew about their hope, and I also knew that their, the, the troubles in their life were so overshadowed by the way they moved in the world and by the love that they had in the world for, wha for whatever it was, whether it were, you know, was for a spouse or a child. I, so it's, it's, um, it's a situation where I just presented characters that, that were based on people I knew, and this is loosely based, I mean, this is fiction, but it was just that I knew the communities that I wanted to depict, and um, so it was, it would have been hard not to present them evenly in that way. Um, and I think, you know, I think, I think sometimes people run into trouble when they're, not to discourage people from writing about communities they don't know, but I think it's often hard to do it because you run into the risk of pathologizing or sentimentalizing characters and, um, it's 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 a lot harder to do that if you know the communities and if you um, it's just something that comes through because I know them and I love them 
And so um, I know that their problems don't weigh more than the joy in their lives. And so I can present that balance. And um, and it did, it didn't even feel conscious. I'm glad that I'm glad that people recognized it. But I d I just felt like oh I'm just telling you the story about this person that I know and love. And how how much did New Orleans matter to your ability to tell that story mm -hmm. at that deep rooted sense of place? Well, I think. You know, I grew up in New Orleans. I, I lived here until I was 12, and then I would come back all the time because my dad is still here. So I would I would come back maybe four times a year. I'd probably spend like t two months total in a year in New Orleans. And you know, I just I love the city. It's it's where I it's where I was born. So I think um, I think it's the only place I could have described with so much care and attention. And um, I also think that because of the story that I wanted to tell, which is a um, three-generation story of a family spanning World War II to post-Katrina, um, and, and the story is that although you would expect major advances in this family from the 40s to 2010, it's quite the opposite. There's a, um, there's a decline representative of uh, social and economic decline in pockets of black America. And I wanted to show that unexpected uh, regression. And New Orleans is kind of one of the only places you can really authentically tell that story because you had such a vibrant um, Creole community in the 40s that was doing so well. Um, there aren't many places in the US where you could find a black, so many black families that were thriving economically at that time for the reasons we all know. And so um, to show that decline authentically you know, this was one of the places where it could be done, and I also I I know and love the city so well, and and I always say it's 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 just a softball to to write about New Orleans because it speaks for itself. You have the culture, you have the food, you have you know the parades, and you can kind of just infuse all of that into the novel and the um, the descriptions and the the sensory experience of reading just is magnified because you're talking about a place that does the work for you. I mean, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sells itself, exactly. So, um, yeah, so it, it, it was it was a nice, it was nice to be able to write about New Orleans and, um, and it also helped me to be able to write about New Orleans. So Calvin, you were a witness to the struggle for human rights and really on the front lines, but as an observer, how, how did that feel? And and what did you notice about that struggle for racial equality over the 50 years you covered the book, the ways that it's changed? So easy oh. question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, pro no problem. Right. Um, I was at a gathering uh, in Santa Fe, and um, I met, uh, I was introduced to a young woman who were not so young, I guess, at that point, who, uh, and I rec recognized her name, and it turned out it was uh, Ruby Bridges. Yeah. And the last time I'd seen her, she was six, being escorted into mm -hmm. William France School uh, in New Orleans. Um, and uh, I said, well, it's nice to see you all grown up. I mean, it's been 50 years. Um, and obviously a lot of change in, in, in those 50 years. Um, as to how it how it feels how it felt then being reporter, uh, as I say in this book, um, you you can't pretend that that each side has a equally compelling argument that that, that uh, the people who think everybody should have a right to vote uh, uh, versus the people who think that people try to exercise that right should have their house burned down. Uh, it, obviously not an equal situation. It's not like covering the Michigan-Ohio State game. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so in, as a reporter in those days, uh, one of the problems was uh, detachment or how, how close you were going to get. And, and there were certain things. For instance, I decided uh, at the end, I went to a lot of mass meetings uh, in, in Atlanta because I would be gone on a story during the week and there was at that time a boycott of the of the of the uh, downtown department stores in Atlanta because they wouldn't allow people to sit at the lunch counters and um, 
So I went to a lot of these mass meetings. Um, in fact, I held what I used to call the Martin Luther King Extended Metaphor Contest because the African-American ministers were wonderful at metaphors, uh, but they weren't as good as Martin Luther King, uh, so he wasn't eligible. <laughs> uh, uh, we named it after him. Uh, and at the end of the, these often, particularly Daddy King would say, would pass the hat and then and say, I want you reporters to give. So, well, well couldn't do that. Uh, and and said, well, I really can't do that thing of linking arms and, and singing um, We Shall Overcome because the picture is going to be the next time I want to interview somebody who's the, on the other side. Um, and this came up a lot uh, during the Freedom Rides. And um, in Montgomery, uh, the, the first bus to Jackson left uh, or was leaving. And Claude Sitton in the New York Times and I had a discussion about whether we could get on the bus mm -hmm. and whether that would make us part of the story um, or, or not. Um, and my argument was it's a public bus. Uh, so we, have, so we, we can buy tickets. And an even stronger argument is that other reporters were getting on. Uh, uh, so, so we decided to get on. Um, and uh, he's somebody who covered the South for the New York Times for uh, maybe 10 years and somehow uh, did it with such scrupulous reporting. I mean, he, he didn't, he, there, there wasn't any question about his sympathy, but it, it came out with accurate and, and, and interesting reporting. Um, I, as far as progress, uh, it's obviously different from the time I watched uh, Ruby Bridges go into the school with a, a lot of, of white women uh, around yelling horrible things to a six-year-old uh, or, or watching people throw bricks at Charlie and Hunter's dormitory. Um, and in a time when theoretically, if if I went to, to interview, say, A.P. Turo, who was the NAACP lawyer here, um, I, I, I couldn't get a cab from that side of town to go because it was a black cab rather than a white cab. I mean, I mean there were absurd rules. Uh, it's obviously changed, um, but with all the progress, it's still, um, and, and all the progress the black community has made, I had a chance not long before he died to meet uh, John Hope Franklin, who was one of the most distinguished historians of, of the South, and particularly, I think, uh, uh, Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, John Hope Franklin was an African-American man who was tall, very distinguished looking fellow, w always wore a blue suit, a little white shirt. And, um, and I met him at a, a little reception at the New York Public Library, and I said, um, uh, I've heard an anecdote about you, and I'm not sure it's true, and I'd like to check it, um, but uh, I'm going to keep telling it anyway. Uh, even if it's not true, I want you to know that. And I said, I heard that you were dressed as you are today, standing in the lobby of a hotel. W were, you, were you to meet somebody just after uh, it was in some town, I keep thinking maybe Knoxville or Nashville, uh, and, and a white salesman dropped a bag in front of you and said, take this to 1035. Uh, and you said, I'm retired. Uh, <laughs> uh, not, not on the James Duke Professor Emeritus of History, uh, Duke, uh, I'm retired. So a lot of restraint. Well, I think the, to me the story it means that th there really hasn't been a, an end. I mean, and and, and um, uh, I I I think I I think I spent a year in the South. Re I'd read a lot of the things that reporters read before they start reporting in the South, and I and I thought I knew a lot of stuff, but uh, I don't think I understood what was going on until 
I, I was talking to Charlene Hunter, who was one of the first two undergraduates, black undergraduates, to go to the University of Georgia. Um, and she was in a dormitory by herself, and there was a lot of harassment. We used to talk on the phone sometime. We're, we're still friends. And um, she had made a speech in Savannah and was talking about coming back to Atlanta on the train. And I said, how was the trip? And she said, it was a terrible trip on the train. And I said, well, I heard that that was a really good train, the Nancy Hanks or something. It's a famous train. She said, well, you know, not where we have to sit. And all, all I knew about history and Plessy versus Ferguson and the question between intrastate and interstate transportation and all that it just kind of drained away. Mm. And I thought, they can't make her sit back there because mm. um, that was personal. And, and I think still with black people, uh, it's, it's still personal. Uh, and and I, a, a very good one sentence I heard from a, a black comedian, uh, his last name was Carmichael, I can't remember his first name. I think Gerard, Gerard, Gerard. He said, being, being black in America is exhausting. Uh, and I think that's what white people sometimes forget is that it's personal and it's exhausting because it, you, you have to face it every day. Uh, so that part hasn't changed, and uh, I, I couldn't say whether whether it ever will. You know. So. so my question, and it's one that I really, really want you all to have answers to because <laughs> it's important, um, is the world right now we have increasing turmoil and separation and divisions in society that it's hard to imagine things getting worse and in many ways we can remember times when they were in fact worse and bombs were going off and we had more violence but it's um we're in a world where that that common language of values um elizabeth you talked about the the personally held religious convictions that during the movement dr king as a religious leader could use that language could make use of the language of common values and could talk to people across those differences and we are in a world now where we have such stratification of sources of news. There's no longer Time Magazine and The New Yorker and CBS Evening News. Um, uh, and I know things are bad. I was telling Calvin when my husband will sometimes post some of his satire writing thinking it's real news <laughs> on Facebook. And I have to correct him, no, no, that was just a joke. <laughs> it's not an actual story. Um, and but where people think that human rights are this limited commodity, and if I have more, you have less, and that we are doing battle over those rights. So how do we, in all the various ways that you all write, um, how do we reach across those differences to persuade people that human rights are a pie that grows and not one that's a competition? It, it, and in any order. Mm. Sometimes, sometimes, depending on the, the situation, there's very little you can do, except keep, keep doing what you know uh, works, or, or being very um, aware of your contribution, in my case, writing is part of my contribution, and the limits of that. Uh, history is like that. Things get out of control sometimes. Um, I'm from Costa Rica, now we're facing a very similar situation that, that the, uh, like the situation we have been experiencing in the United States for the past two years. Um, for presidential ele election, the, the, the possible winner is gonna be an evangelical pastor that thinks about human rights as simply uh, the imposition of the minority on um, the majority and abusive, et cetera. So we have to go from there to try to communicate the best way we can. That is not really the issue. Everybody knows. Everybody can say, no, no, well, if, if, if uh, gay people want to get married, it's, that's not going to affect your rights as a straight person. But that's not the language that is. Uh, that is used, you know, in the political campaign in Costa Rica is not the language that we have been uh, 
here in, here in their states or, uh, since 2016, even before election day. So uh, as a writer, as um, an activist, I would say, well, you have control over many things, but you have to try to do your best. And also activism changes. And it's curious that I'm talking about writing as activists, but and writing also changes. Uh, and sometimes what you do is better, sometimes it's not that effective. Or among other things, because when reality happens, you need some time to understand the reality. And even to understand how to negotiate with reality. So the, the, the only advice that I can give is keep trying. Keep <coughs> trying and keep trying. That's good. Yeah, I, I agree. There's no silver bullet, right? It's mm -hmm. about conversations. Um, it's about finding commonality. Um, I, I flew here from Israel. I, I gave a talk on this global forum combating anti-Semitism in Israel, talking about anti-Semitism in the LGBT community. Both ways, going to and from Israel, I was seated with some evangelical Christians um, on the plane. And, and you know, I kind of like planned the whole thing out of like kind of having them fall in love with me and then sort of like, before, you know, around dinner and then for breakfast, because it was a red, a red eye both ways, um, kind of dropped the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> They've been sitting next to this queer activist, um, and, uh, and and <laughs> and so and, and and you know this is this is I mean I, I want to say this is how change happens, but that sounds grandiose that they're going to go back to their church and be like we met this lovely lesbian, she's just so fat. But <laughs> but I mean I do I, I guess in my fantasy I do imagine that like sort of maybe then they'll flash back to sort of me at the voting booth or something I don't know when they're next trying to deprive me of my rights. But, but um, I, I mean, I do think it is about finding connections, right? I mean, it is about finding a commonality uh, and, and sort of our shared uh, uh, oppression, whatever it, it may be, you know? Of course, they feel like they're oppressed because they feel like their religious beliefs aren't um, being embraced um, enough. But anyway, uh, it, it's, it's sort of uh, like Linda Sarsour talks about how, um, you know, no one can talk about my, nobody can talk about my oppression but me as the oppressed, right? So, so it, it, if in that way, if you sort of don't take that narrative away from someone else, whatever their narrative is, however you might regard it, um, I mean, I think that's sort of an important step, right? Um, and, and, and things are, I mean, things, are, Calvin, you're right, things are really personal. I mean, and, and I mean, I, we know that no civil rights movement has ever ended. So we know that we are, are all on a, a continual journey uh, for the full lived equality uh, of all of us in this room and, and all of our various identities. And so, you know, I guess I, I'm like a little hopeful, not just because of wonderful conversations that I just had in these two plane trips, but, but of, of, I mean, gosh, you can't sit here the day after this march yesterday and not have a little bit of hope, right? I mean, you, you gotta, we've gotta think about how maybe there's that, that's like that, I feel like maybe there's this little blessing in the trump apocalypse that people are like waking up, right? Maybe, I mean, certainly queers have gotten really complacent. A lot of folks were like, oh, oh marriage, good, we're done, okay. You know, and, uh, and, and, <laughs> and so it's like, oh, oh, wake up. You know, there is a lot of work still to do. You know, for all of us who care about social justice issues, whatever, Whatever issue it is that animates you, whatever keeps you up at night, whatever whatever you know gets you to strap on your, your protest boots and, and draft a sign, but but to see the amazing kind of coalition of voices uh, that we saw yesterday, I mean that we see at, at every march. You know, I live in Miami, which is not a particularly progressive place, and it's really I think ignited uh, a, a lot of folks in, in in outrage and has has gotten people once again to link arms and and to walk shoulder to shoulder to advance you know, all of our issues. And I think that is that is truly where change happens, where we start to think beyond our own oppression and, and we're able to kind of think about how like that rising tide lifts all boats. What is that like to have to, if you want to have a friend, be a friend, you know, to not just say, okay, now it's time to, to advance my issue. So you, you come stand with me. But then when it's time for like your issue, I'm, I'm over here, I'm just gonna have this cup of coffee and just good luck to you. You know, we, we, we do need to remember that it is so critically important that on all these issues, even something that may not keep us up at night personally, that, that we do need to, to link arms and, and stand together with our allies so that we can, we can have friends, 
be friends and, and hopefully push through this moment in, in a, uh-oh, a question. Did I say something upsetting? Um, can I can I ask a question but only if it's fast? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> so I mean I I was really curious about the the wine and you just suggested adding uh you know some kind of luxury scent. Uh-huh. Uh, certainly uh around the world mm -hmm. but also in this country. Um where uh you know they are not allowed to study the same room at night. Uh they are you know getting together they meet in open So actually, let me, let's address that next. Let's finish the answer to mm -hmm. this question, and, and okay. we'll come back to that. Okay. We'll do a Q&A at the end. Yeah. Do you want to just wait and okay. we could yeah. do it then? Oh. Yeah. Hi. Voice I'm over here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll just echo what a lot of um, the panelists have said. I think, I think for, um, and I am optimistic. I am, as you said, it's exhausting not to be optimistic, and also, I know, I've seen the history of the country as it affects my own family. I, my father was born into Jim Crow and my father lives a very good life now. And that's an anecdote, but that's obviously representative of the systemic changes that have taken place. Having said that, I mean, I wrote a whole book about how, you know, although we've had, we've had certain advances like the end of Jim Crow, et cetera, we've had other systemic replacements to take the place of the Jim Crow system to do the work for it, like the war on drugs, like mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that there's obviously, we're all here because there's so much work to be done, but but I am optimistic and I think I think my optimism is based in personal relationships. I really, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that's how people are, that's, it seems like that's how you learned about this, about the plight of Muslims, or maybe that's not how you learned about it, but maybe that's how it became so central to, to your concern as an activist. I mean, you live next door to one. I think you have to have these personal relationships or it's not gonna be relevant for you or interesting. Um, it's not gonna be important enough for you to dedicate your energy um, or your compassion to it. And um, I just, I always think about, um, in this in this book, there's this character, TC, who's a drug dealer and, um, and you know he's in his 20s and he's in and out of jail and my father-in-law is this white male radiologist okay and um he he called me after he read the book and he said i think tc is my favorite character mm -hmm. i really related to him <laughs> and he's this white male radiologist <laughs> in his 60s and tc is this you know guy from new orleans east who's who's in and out of jail and you wouldn't see an ostensible you know relationship there you wouldn't see any any ostensible cause for empathy or compassion, but I think, I think, you know, I'm his daughter-in-law. I think his heart is a little bit more open because of that. I think this. I think this. You know, he read about a character in literature and fell in love with the humanity of the character. And I think that's the kind of. I think these are the kinds of relationships that that cause you. You can know about something on a theoretical level or a logical level, and then and then you hear that your friend has to sit through mm -hmm. the back of the train, and mm -hmm. it's like, oh. Okay, and I think it's that kind of thing that's going to drive us forward. Just, um, just those relationships mm -hmm. that that bear the the, the connections that are going to um, motivate us. Um, well, I'm old enough to remember uh, the presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower, <coughs> and he, he said when people said, "Why don't you do more about the, the segregated South?" He always said, uh, you can't legislate morality. Well, you can't legislate morality, although the government tries to do it all the time, but uh, you can legislate behavior. Uh, and I think that, that both law and, and the culture set certain parameters of what people can say and what they can do, and, they, and th those change, and eventually they become normal. I. Uh, Anybody my age, any any male my age, uh, who says, including gay males, 
who says that when he was young, he never said anything that would be considered offensive now to gay people is lying or has a very bad memory. Um, and and, and th this was in the culture. I remember Dean Rusk, uh, a supposedly liberal Secretary of State, had a press conference once and uh, there was some picketing uh, outside of the press conference, but I think it was the Mattachine Society, one of the early gay mm -hmm. groups. Um, and he made a joke about it and everybody laughed. Mm -hmm. And this was the Secretary of State. Well, now think of that now. I mean, the, 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 the laws have changed and the culture has changed. Or, or, or think of, of the, I mean, the, there was a huge fight to get uh, homosexuality removed from the uh, DSM uh, dictionary of whatever it's called, statistical something, yeah. diagnostic and statistical, yeah. yeah. um, uh, by the psych psychological association. Um, and but, but once those things are done and are done and, and are sort of what amounts to, to settled law for, for 10 or 15 years, pe people's behaviors change. Um, uh, n not brilliantly sometimes, but, mm -hmm. but still the, the just think of the difference between the joke and, and, and now. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that there are people in, in this country uh, who don't want to change, uh, and specifically, um, uh, I mean, they're bigots. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, they're against all of that. Uh, and there are people who take advantage of, of the situation. I mean, for instance, in the New Orleans school desegregation, uh, when there was this huge fight over getting uh, two or three kids into first grade. Uh, there was something like 500 African Americans at LSU and uh, They were going to school with white people, uh, but but it was the advantage of the politicians to forget about that and and say we we will we will never integrate the schools. Um, there there are people who even now are. are take advantage of, of racial and, and other kinds of, of hostility. But, but then, then I think we have to face the fact there are people who believe in it. Uh, there are people who genuinely believe that, that uh, black people are inferior and, and uh, Jews run both the banks and the Communist Party. And, and uh, um, Don't forget the media. And the mm -hmm. media Thank is. Uh, I have a couple of things I picked up once at a Republican National Convention that say the media is lying and quit lying and um, yeah, the media is, is, is part of it. But uh, so I, I think I, I, I think it's a slow proce process and and I I think we're gradually moving. But um, when you try to think back about twenty or thirty years ago. My daughters always say when I say something happened 15 or 20 years ago, it's usually 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no sense uh, yes. But so I, so I, I guess I'm almost cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> almost. So, so let me build on the question from the audience, and then we'll, we'll get to Q&A soon. Um, uh, there are ways that... Um, we have so many people in the position of oppressed and oppressor and those issues of intersectionality. So um, the left often in, in worrying about religious freedom and attacks on Muslims may overlook the gender discrimination that often happens. The right conversely will eagerly point out that gender discrimination of Muslim communities and ignoring the unbelievable amounts of gender discrimination in other communities, right? So we have a steady drumbeat of domestic violence murders, but if it's an Iraqi immigrant killing his wife, that's what makes national news, not the 1,500 murders we have a year here of, um, of women for not being obedient enough. Um, and so we have that way that we tend to want to focus on one issue at a time. Um, Elizabeth, you raised this, and this is much of your writing, Uriel, is how do we um, get beyond the sort of in internal battles of who's more oppressed, the oppressed Olympics, um, of 
of understanding that often many of us ha are in both sets of shoes. Any of you who want to answer? <laughs> There's not easy answer for that. <coughs> but what makes the difference is when you realize that something's going on. Sometimes you don't know that you're the oppressor. You don't know. Again, and, the, and uh, talking about the LGBT communication, now there's a lot of talking about trans people. Not like never before. But many of us have been through the process of acknowledging, number one, yeah, there are trans people Yes, we are all discriminated, and yes, I've been discriminated against trans people. I can tell you that, that many uh, uh, gay men, uh, uh, lesbians, they cannot really have a conversation about trans people. And I would say, I, I, I cannot claim that I'm better than those people, but at least what I can claim is, okay, and acknowledging that that's a problem, that we are discriminating against our own people. And that's, for me, the beginning of change, always. Um, about those priorities, it's also a constant struggle. We, uh, uh, Latino, Latinas, we are never a priority. We're not. When? Talking a, a little bit about silence, that is, I will say, is one of your concerns. This book, <laughs> because it has a very nice cover. <laughs> uh, this book is it's an attempt to break the, the cycle of silence. Do you think that many things have changed with regard to media coverage, with regard to mm, a conversation? No. So the next thing that that uh, uh, people in the community have to do is try it again and keep working, keep working on the uh, the very important issues. Um, it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating, but I think it's part of the game. Frustration, overcoming the frustration, and moving forward. So I um, don't want to lose our time before Q&A without asking Calvin about his chapter on the Zulus. Um, and in the context of a parade started at the turn of the century is the one way during segregation you could sort of mock white racism by having black people in blackface. Um, and how uh, you took a look at the, um, the ways the modern civil rights movement in the mid 60s saw that parade and whether mm -hmm. it still was useful and whether it was problematic and if and um, what you found. Well, the Zulus is, uh, those of you who are from New Orleans know, uh, so, there were Social Aid and Pleasure Club, which was a, essentially in New Orleans a burial society um, and a form of burial insurance. And, but they were the only ones who had a parade permit to parade on, on Mardi Gras on Shrove Tuesday. And, um, they went in, um, in blackface uh, and wore often grass skirts and threw, instead of uh, tr uh, trinkets, they threw coconuts. Mm -hmm. And instead of having a captain, they had a, a man called Big Shot from Africa. Um, and, and as you heard, they were, they were partly a parody, although once I asked the captain of Rex about how he felt about Zulu's Parody, he said, oh, he, he couldn't see it at all. The, they were a parody of the, <laughs> just, it just got right past him. Right. <laughs> it's, I got, what? He was, oh, the, the, the captain of Rex was definitely white. By definition, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was what I used to call in the, kind of in the South where, because people sort of didn't see what was happening with black people. And once during, during the boycott of the, of the department stores in Atlanta, I asked a friend of mine who was a cousin of, of one of the people who sort of ran the biggest and most influential department store. I, I said, how, how is uh, Emma, I think her name was, the, their, 
their housekeeper doing with all of this? She was black. And, and they said, she's been great. She just said, uh, till all this is over, I'm just going to stay away from all of this thing and not go downtown. And I said, she's boycotting his store. <laughs> so what? I said, she told him she's boycotting his store and he still can't hear it. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, a, a, a lot of, there's a lot of, of talk that goes on that, that but l look at the difference between now and a year ago, not 15 or 20 years ago, uh, but a year ago in, in sexual harassment. Um, here these people get toppled one by one and, and, if, and if someone who has said to you um, uh, how uh, pretty soon all of these important uh, entertainment and, and media figures are going to lose their jobs for, for, for talking a certain way to women, you would say that's impossible. So, 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 things, so things do move move quickly sometime when, when the culture changes. Um, I'm now, oh, the Zulus, we were talking about Zulus. What, what in, what's interesting to me about the Zulus, and I've done a couple of pieces on the Zulus, is that in, I, I, in the first piece I said, in Atlanta, they would have been off the street in 10 minutes. The, the black society of Atlanta, uh, uh, community of Atlanta simply would not have that. Uh, they would have been gone. Um, New Orleans, New Orleans was less organized in the black community. The, the people who had been here longest, the, the sort of downtown, what we would then call downtown Negroes sometimes, uh, many of them were artisans and things. And they, and they, I think it's important to know they, they, a lot of them were Catholic. And so they, they didn't have the sort of black ministers uh, who led the civil rights movement. So. Anyway, they didn't have a cohesive, and, and a lot of the downtown people thought that the people in the Zulus were basically a different race. Uh, and and um, so there they were, uh, supposedly this disgraceful thing, and the, the respectable people in the black community tried to get rid of them for years, and they couldn't do it. And finally, they sort of infiltrated them. Uh, they joined the Zulus, and, and so now the Zulus I wasn't here this Mardi Gras, but I think they still parade yes. in, in blackface, and, and, and even including some white people in blackface. Which, um, and it's taken. And the mayor w marches with them, or used to. I don't know if he still does. And and one of the, the former queen of the Zulus was the was at the White was at Obama's administration at the White House. She was the social director. So, it it's it's sort of an argument for the. English professors who say that the text doesn't make as much difference as what you bring to the text. Uh, so they're doing the same thing they did when I wrote about them in 1960 something, uh, but people see it as this kind of kind of funny, quaint uh, New Orleans tradition instead of a, an offensive uh, race thing. Um, so I. I think I, th I think the Zulus make it very interesting, but complicated, um, and a lot of this stuff is complicated. For instance, uh, on on Muslim women, um, there 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 are two or th two or three ways to think of that. One of them is, it, this is their religion. Say, uh, I mean, they would say, uh, I'm I would say. They would say this is their religion, and they would say uh, ultra orthodox Jews separate men and women, and 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 an orthodox male uh, Jewish male won't shake hands with a woman, uh, won't touch a woman who's not his wife, um, and so you're impringing on their religious freedom uh, by saying that. I don't happen to believe that, but what I'm saying is that these these things have a lot of elements. Uh, to them, uh, so you you can be against one thing and for one thing and halfway on the other thing. But um, it, I think it's a, and it's a it's a difficult problem, particularly w w concerning women in Muslim Muslim societies. 
and they would say, they would say, Jews circumcise the boys. Well, what's the difference? It's genital mutilation. I mean, the people, the, no, the people who argue that. Big difference. What? No, there's yeah. No, no, I'm not. I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying I believe this. I'm, I'm yeah. just saying that, they, that, that, that that's what they would say, uh, and and uh, uh, and it, and circumcision is cultural. The, the the number and it was going down in America, and 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 it was still way above what it is say in England. So, so I don't know, I don't know I that's true, I, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, there's it's a different tradition, right? It's a different tradition. Okay, no, no, no. You it, understand? It's I'm, I'm, I'm not defending this. Yeah. I'm So this well, is, we're going to go to um, Q&A, but th this is a profound issue of religious right. Well, for example, that um, there are lots of arguments to be made that circumcising baby boys before they have a choice in the matter that doesn't, um, and anyway, yeah. the, I used they to ought teach They ought to raise their, babies ought, ought to raise their hand. Yeah. Yeah. To they ought to have to raise their hand. I consent to, ah. exactly. is that what you're saying? They're too drunk. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But that's it, true, drunk on the wine. It, right? It's, it's um, that divide between religious freedom and, well, and uh, human rights is I'm, But is they say that there is, that's all I'm saying. Okay. All right, so but let's go to other questions in the before, audience. Before, before we, we take another question, I just, yeah, yeah let's take questions. It is, yes. Quickly, though, I wanted to clarify something. When I announced that the University of New Orleans sponsored this panel, that it's partly true, I wanted to be more specific. It was the Ethel and Herman L. Midlow Center mm -hmm. for New Orleans Studies, so I was asked to point that out. Great. So let's Thank give them a round of applause, Thank please, you. and then we'll take some questions. Thank you, everyone. Elizabeth, you touched on this, so, but it's a question for anyone who wants to answer. It's about the uh, discrimination based on religious freedom. I'm from Canada, ah. okay, so I, I mean, I'm aware of the this. The promised land. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, it's not so promised, believe me, but yeah. uh, I'm aware of this in the mm. state, and particularly right now, because this is more where I'm concerned about, is the powerful organizations in the states focused on the family using this religious freedom to tear down the laws banning conversion therapy. Right. They're, they're starting to do this. And generally, I'm wondering, my question is, what happened to the separation of church and state? Oh. Uh, how does this yeah. not work in the states? I mean, how can you not have this separation? I'm, I mean, well, because I, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just quickly say you, you can't. I mean, it's unconstitutional. It's a, it's a deprivation of our rights to equal protection. It's a deprivation. There's there's this also this, the establishment clause. Like it's unconstitutional. You cannot. The government cannot establish one religion preference for one religion over the other. You know. The, so so lawsuits are being brought. And one. I mean, these religious discrimination uh, uh, victories are are mounting. Of course, the problem is that it, lawsuits take a lot of time. And so real people's lives are impacted like every day, all the time from this, the emboldening of, of folks to think that they have the right to discriminate based on religious grounds and use that as, as, as a very thin, thin, thin pretext to, to make moral judgments on folks. So, so the answer is you, you can't, but, and so that's why we need to continue to be vigilant, really fight. I mean, I, you know, we're suing folks left and right, write your checks to the National Center for Lesbian Rights, write your checks to Lambda Legal, write your checks to the ACLU, although frankly the ACLU doesn't need your money, but write your checks to the ACLU. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing great. You know, one, of the, one of the crazy downsides of, of the onslaught on, on, uh, on personal uh, rights, individual liberties, is that uh, you know, folks like Planned Parenthood and the ACLU have enjoyed uh, a, an amazing groundswell of support from, from folks like you and hopefully lots of folks in this room who are really concerned about the evisceration of our rights. So I, I want to get to other questions. Sorry, sorry, no. One yeah. Thing that the, well, okay. So, so it's like, th so this is like, this is such a longer conversation. I don't want to take time, but Big I mean, topic. this is part of the problem with, 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 it depends who you end up in front of, right? So forget Gorsuch, he's a nightmare in and of himself. He's young, he's gonna live a long time. But what the administration is doing is, is appointing and confirming 
federal judges at the lower levels, right, not the Supreme Court, that have lifelong appointments. So, so when I say, so your question specifically was like, how can you do this? Like, how, how, sh how is it possible that you could do this under the law in the United States? And the answer is, you can't do this under the law in the United States. It is unconstitutional on many grounds. But, but if you want to get deeper into, well, are these cases going to like win or not win? Well, it depends who they're in front of. That's the problem. There's, there are folks who are really trying to take us back. Anyway, come to my next thing or let's talk afterwards because I want to hear other questions. But thank you for asking. Yeah, yeah I just, I, oh. really quickly, I want to, um, I want to, touch base on something that was said in the audience um, because it relates to the question of the hierarchy of oppression that was brought up earlier. Um, and I'm just going to quite try to be really quick. I think, I think a lot of it is in the spirit of, of um, how we think about certain types of oppression. And I think, and I'm sure you didn't mean it this way, but when you say something like, if a black woman had walked into a church and was told to go into a separate room, all hell would have broken loose, or however you said it, it, there's something about the way that's phrased mm -hmm. that implies that that black woman wouldn't deserve the level of attention you say she would have gotten. Mm -hmm. And I know that you didn't mean it that way, but I just want to I want to touch on that because it speaks to the spirit of the way we're looking at oppression. Mm -hmm. I think the way if you want to talk about if you want to talk about honoring each person's oppression, then you need to be thinking about it in terms of what I need to live in a world where anybody who mm -hmm. is discriminated against when they walk into a church, feels protected and right. feels like they, they have, a, they have a, a right to a sense of liberation and where they move. And I think that's the way, when you're thinking about it from the lens of, I want to live in a just world, that's the way you phrase it. You don't talk about it in terms of, if this person had mm -hmm. gone in there, and it could be anybody, then they would, because it implies that that person is less deserving of these rights than the other, or that there's a scarcity of liberation, and there isn't. We all need it. We all right. deserve it. And so I think the language around that needs to be, it needs to be changed because the, the language is reflecting the very limited way in which we're thinking about it. There That's what go. happens when a lawyer becomes a writer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask uh, Calvin. Um, I'm wondering about inspirational figures in the civil ri rights movement besides Martin Luther King. Any standouts for you? And also how you view Allard Lowenstein and his role versus Bob Moses and their split in the uh, SNCC uh, 64 mm. Wow, wow that's a long question. There's five minutes left. <laughs> this, is, this is a scholar of the middle 60s. Uh, I, uh, I think Robert Moses was, was uh, an inspirational leader. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are, aren't aware of this, he, he, he came down from uh, very well-educated, uh, guy came down to join SNCC, to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and was willing to stuff envelopes and everything. And he's a, kind of a humble guy. And uh, he, he started the, the idea of instead of gradually looking for the easier targets of going to the place where it was the worst place, which was everybody agreed was Mississippi, uh, and, and doing the most unassailable thing, which is to try to vote. Uh, and that became the, the uh, Freedom Summer of 1964. Al Al Lowenstein was uh, an interesting figure in, in American life. He, he, um, he was a student activist who never became anything but a student activist, no matter what <laughs> other kind of jobs he held. Um, but um, he... Um, in his 30s, and I don't know how old he, he was before he was killed, um, you could still imagine him in sitting in some tattered uh, armchair in a, in a student dorm arguing. Um, and uh, I think he played the role of, of uh, getting people, getting students involved. When there's some similarities to, this, to what's going on now with the Parkland people, um, and uh, I covered one of his, I covered his congressional race, uh, and, and uh, I had known him since college. He was, he was, a, he was a freshman counselor when he was in law school at Yale, and I was an undergraduate, uh, and he was exactly the same. Um, I told him when I covered his, his campaign, I said, uh, 
don't worry if if you get if you lose it's just as good a story for me as if you win and if you get hit upside the head it's even better story for me so uh, he uh, my theory in that was that in that campaign was that Al grew, drew people in but sort of radical they became radicalized unfortunately with their experience in in American democracy and got more radical and sort of sort of moved away from Al. Um, and I think Robert Moses was a seminal figure and, and, um, um, uh, and of course went on to start, I think it's called the Algebra Project and, and got an uh, honorary degree from Harvard and, and, and was a MacArthur Fellow. And, uh, so I think, I think those, those are two people. There were, there were wonderful women uh, um, Fannie Lou Hamer in uh, Mississippi and Victoria DeLee in, in South Carolina who um, became the leaders of, of and I mean, in theory they were, they were less vulnerable to kind of physical attack than men but only in theory but certainly Mrs. DeLee had her house shot up a lot um, so I think there were a lot of them and, I, and I, as I said before uh, the, the black ministers, the Baptists and, and AME ministers, uh, I could imagine them going in the other direction. I mean, they were, they were better off than most of their, their uh, congregation. They were, um, but, but they, they took a lot of risks and, and, uh, and I think without them, there probably wouldn't have been that sort of an effective movement. We have time for one last question. It's not a question, I'm sorry. It may interest you to know that Al Lowenstein's son, Tom, lives in New Orleans and is a wonderful writer. Uh -huh. The Trials of Walter yeah. Ogrod. Yeah. 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 So one last question. Okay, one more, anybody? You had your hand up for a while. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. right here in the front. Okay. <laughs> we, have about three, we have about three minutes. Okay. Contrary to what most of us, uh, the, the myths most of us were afraid in, uh, were fed in school, this country has never been a melting pot. It's been more like a salad where each element maintains its separateness. I think it's what's happening now, I don't like this term minority, which is a demographic term, and you know, it's be you know the minorities are becoming the majority. I think, I think the term marginalized mm -hmm. is much better mm -hmm. because what's happening now is that previously marginalized uh, people in society are becoming mainstream mm -hmm. and they are, they are asserting themselves. And it's the old straight white male establishment that mm -hmm. feels threatened and this is why that we have all of these mm -hmm. you know the conflicts going on and and in this sense I don't want to sound too much like a Hegelian or <laughs> Marxist but this this conflict shows something positive mm -hmm. that it's yes. it, you know we are we're developing hopefully into something better so I don't think the idea of struggle mm -hmm. and conflict and tension is something to feel pessimistic about. Right, right. I think it's a sign of progress. It's a salad with some bugs on the lettuce. <laughs> right. This, it's a great, I think mm. that's a great point, yeah. right? It's like to end on because it's yeah. hopeful. You're absolutely yeah. right. And, and, and I, I do, I, I sort of think this is maybe the last gasp of, of, mm -hmm. of those folks, right? As you describe them. So let's, let's hope and. We, we like to say here, it's our not melting pot, but gumbo. Gumbo. For the oh. same reason. So thank you for that. And thank you to a wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.